Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Minig. I'm the host of Behavioral Health Integration Podcast. Today, our episode is Psychedelic Assisted Therapy, and I have a very special guest, Rick O'Bannon. He is a graduate student at Adler Graduate School, and he's also the founder of the Adlerian Psychedelic Society. Rick, it's our pleasure having you here on my podcast. Thank you, man. Thanks, Jake. It's wonderful to be here. So right off the bat, I just have to ask you, what originally got you into this field? What was the passion? What was that moment that you knew, hey, I got to be a therapist? Well, uh, I, I like to tell the story. Uh, I'll, I'll try not to be so long-winded about it because that's, that's typically how I work. But I got interested in psychology when I was in about eighth grade. I picked up a book by Carl Jung. Um, Young, yes. and, <laughs> and that's real exactly exactly and that's really kind of what set the stage for my entire life uh, when I started reading Carl Jung I didn't understand a word he was saying I just knew that what he's saying was important um, so it was just throughout my life that I, my continued uh, passion towards psychology depth psychology um, religion um that kind of kind of got me started and propelled me into this field. Okay. Very good. Very good. Now, what then got you interested in psychedelic therapies to go along with therapy? Um, psychedelic therapy in general for me kind of started in 2003, which I, I lovingly refer to as uh, the psychedelic summer. Um, I had various experiences with multiple sacred substances, um, and at that point, I was kind of a loser, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I was kind of floating through life, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and um, it was that summer that I kind of got re uh, reintroduced into my meaning and purpose in life. Mm. Um, I reconnected with my, uh, my, I guess, my oldest daughter now. She's 21. Um, she kind of was a inspiration for me to be a better person, a better man, a better human being. Um, so that's kind of what uh, got me interested in it. And after that summer, I knew that these, these substances were very powerful um, and used in the right kind of context. It could bring about some healing to a lot of uh, pain and suffering that humanity has. Absolutely. No, that's more geared towards like depression, anxiety, PTSD. And they've obviously done a lot of studies to show that there is um, possible growth in that and improvements. That's like, absolutely. Health. Absolutely. Um, also e eating disorders, um, mm -hmm. smoking sensation, uh, end of life uh, care for ca cancer patients. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And of course, that's really the, the medical model for it. Um, that's not even talking about the wellness model or the mm. spiritual elements that uh, these, these compounds have to it. Could you actually go into the, the spiritual aspect of it a little bit more? That's uh, really I would, interesting. I would be, I'd be glad uh, to because that's really, I think that's really where I'm going to end up on my journey um, through the individuation process, to quote Carl Jung. Um, the spiritual element, uh, a lot of these compounds have been used for thousands of years. Um, some of the oldest uh, paintings that we have on cave walls depict mushrooms, whether they were psilocybin-containing mushrooms um, or Amanita muscaria. Um, we, I guess we don't know yet, uh, or we, don't, we will never know. However, there are places in Mexico that use it in a spiritual context. Um, a lot of these substances are used by places like the Native American church. Mm -hmm. um, indigenous peoples of America uh, have really been using them for, for a long time. Uh, and, and it's very, it, it, it brings a lot of warmness to the heart to see those kind of modalities being used inside of the, the spiritual element. Um, but the mystical experience uh, that these substances bring about really create a whole lot of change inside of the mind. And I mean, we could talk about how that happens or why that happens, but I think it really comes down to meaning and purpose in one's own individual life that, that really, uh, really makes that uh, the difference. 
And I did a little digging myself, and especially when it comes to like trauma and individuals with severe PTSD, like when they get into these type of therapies with psychedelics, I have felt or I have seen it really calms the person down and they can kind of go back into those moments of trauma and really it makes it easier for them to be in the moment and express their story. You know, it puts them in a good uh, positive state of mind when doing that. So I guess that's what I found to be another benefit as well. To that. I mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but it also really depends on the medicine that is being used. Mm. Uh, MDMA uh, most certainly allows people to access past traumas. Um, but things like the classic psychedelics like psilocybin, uh, DMT, LSD, yes. um, serenogenic, ser- I can never say that word right, <laughs> serenogenic, uh, I'm not even know if I'm even saying that right either. Um, but, um, a lot of those things occasion mystical experiences, um, that works in a little different context, uh, than MDMA does. Um, but MDMA has been shown to be super effective with, uh, with, with trauma, uh, especially with, um, uh, I guess would be, uh, military first responders, uh, police officers, uh, that is, that is being widely beneficial to the help of those, those individuals. And to piggyback off that, that's another passion of mine is that my thesis was actually on veterans with PTSD and substance abuse disorders. And well, originally mine was exercise science and how that can benefit, but just the fact that it's helped many veterans with PTSD was again, a huge joy, you know, just in my heart to, you know, find that out, you know, that's something I definitely want to get more into as well. Oh, for sure. Especially listening to your podcast. Every time you brought it up, uh, all I could think of is MDMA assisted psychotherapy. (laughs) Uh, uh, Rick Doblin, um, he at MAPS, he really did, uh, did the world a, a great service. I mean, he believed in the, the safety and the efficacy for MDMA, and he knew that the, the way to bring it back into our culture, since it was uh, scheduled as a Schedule I um, substance, mm-hmm. he knew that um, appealing to the, the veterans and that experience a lot of trauma, uh, he really crossed the, the, the side of the aisles, both to, mm-hmm. with the Republicans and the Democrats that way. Uh, so uh, kudos to Rick out there. Absolutely. And another thing I want to kind of bring up with you, if you don't mind, is um, the stigmas and fears people may have with psychedelics. Like, why do you feel, in your mind, if it does, it's so much, I guess, negative stigma in itself? Um, the negative stigma really was attached to the war on drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Controlled Substance Act uh, that was enacted and subsequently, you know, the D.A.R.E. campaign, um, society really latched onto that. Uh, these are very powerful substances that can elicit very powerful changes in people. Um, but the media like to concentrate on all of the negative press that it got during that time period. And unfortunately, the war on drugs was really a systematic campaign against minority populations. I mean, it, it, it's very racist, and we all know that now, but yet the government still has not loosens, loosened its uh, restrictions on it. It's, it's super unfortunate. And it's funny because programs like D.A.R.E. have not had hardly any success as well, too. It's just ironic in a sense. It most certainly is ironic. Um, ironic is most certainly the word that I would describe it. Um, it's 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 really sad because, you know, the the war on drugs is pretty much coming to the end, and the drugs have won. Um, mm-hmm. We look at places like Spain and Portugal that have instigated decriminalization policies, and they actually saw the rate of addiction go down, uh, but yet. We're, we're still over here in America. We're supposed to be the best country in the world, but we can't enact drug policies that actually benefit the common man. And I, I also wonder if it's more just the media, you know, the fear that media puts into the general population about just these type of drugs in general and how it will 
ruin your life, you know, if you take this particular drug or the psychedelic. And again, I wonder if it just causes fear in people not to even try something like this, even though there's a huge chance it could be extremely beneficial. I think that you're on to something there. And it, don't get me wrong, there are casualties to a lot of these substances. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're really in, uh, I mean, if you just use, say, the, the heroin epidemic that we have in America, uh, the, it ruins people's lives. Uh, but we don't talk about the, the people that um, don't have addiction problems because you don't see those highlighted in, in the news. Uh, people like Dr. Carl Hart uh, mm-hmm. and his book, uh, Drug Use for Grownups, he highlights a lot of the, these kind of things. I mean, he's a big proponent, neuroscientist, psychologist, and he, he's a huge proponent for drug use for people that are responsible. Uh, the, but the, the big problem is adulterants in a lot of these substances that cause the problem. When you make something illegal, people go to the black market, and it's often cut with other substances in those drugs that can cause a lot of problems for a lot of people, such as fentanyl. I mean, that's that's typically the, the big, biggest example. If everybody had a safe supply, it could be managed a, a whole lot easier. And then we can, look again, look to places like Spain and Portugal uh, for those kind of things. Yeah, and it's pretty cool because we're kind of getting into the harm reduction model. And again, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Carl Hart. I explained something earlier um, or in a past episode where he said there's like a type of machine where you can actually put your drugs in to actually make sure you know what's in it to make sure, again, it is safe for you to take. Because if a person, let's say, dies on a fentanyl or any type of opioid, if any other substances are in that system, the media tends not to announce that. They just say it's an opioid-related death, which legally they can actually do, which is bizarre, but... No, opioids... Um... It, it's a it's a huge problem. I mean, there's all in a lot of other countries, you can actually send your supply in to get tested and you can have those machines in other countries to get tested. Mm-hmm. But yet, if we tried to do something like that here, you would be arrested for drug possession. What we can do about it, um, advocate, I advocate, advocate, advocate. I, th- I think that's probably the only way that we're going to we're going to reach out and try to to try to change some of these problems that exist. Mm -hmm. And another thing I kind of want to add to that regarding like psychedelics, yes, we know it's a drug or whatnot, but through my experience in this field, we still have so many like facilities that still have the goal of complete abstinence from a drug. So their points of view could be, well, how can you take a drug to cure another drug or trauma or other issues with the person rather than doing something like a 12 step, you know, traditional model. Okay, so that's you. You uh, gave me two or three different uh, avenues of thought when you, you were it. talking about this. Nice. Um, so, I, I well, the first avenue uh, that it makes me think of, especially when, in terms of psychedelics being used inside of inside of therapy, for one, the classic psychedelics do not have um, physical addiction. You can't be physically addicted. Actually, it's anti-addictive because. The body builds a tolerance to these the classic psychedelics, um, and when if you were to take a psychedelic, a lot of time you don't want to take that psychedelic for a while just because it's such a powerful experience. MDMA is a little bit different um, because it operates on different uh, different avenues inside of uh, uh, brain chemistry. Uh, but just speaking strictly on um, classic psychedelics, uh, it's not just necessarily the substance that's being used in treatment, it's treatment and the substance. So you're not like most of the time when, if you were, you say you had depression or uh, PTSD, you're prescribed a drug, a a drug to take pretty much your entire life. This doesn't, that, that doesn't work that way with some of these substances. You're administered it between one and four times within a therapeutic context to treat it. And then you, you may not ever have to take that drug again for the rest of your life. Wow. That's amazing. Yep. It really is. It's, it's, 
And a lot of it, I've just, is people may be just really naive to, again, the information you just gave right now. And, and that's why there's the, the education and advocacy portion is so, so important inside of the space. Um, you have people, again, like I know I keep talking about Rick Doblin, but I'm, an, I'm a huge fan of him. But, I mean, he goes out and he advocates and educates people because they may not know. All they hear about is, you know, the, the really misguided studies from the 1970s saying LSD will cause uh, chromosome damage, or which is completely false and has been empirically verified to be false as well. Um, but there's still this narrative inside of our culture that exists that drugs equal bad, even though um, we we uh, we consume drugs on a regular basis, whether it's coffee or coffee, nicotine, alcohol. Some of these create a lot more problems than any of these can could possibly do to an individual. Mm-hmm. And something else that um, what you just said reminds me of is when you said that sometimes people don't like have to like take this for the long term. Like you maybe only need to take it once or twice and you could be good for a very long time. But then I see people take like antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications every day, which again, I'm not saying is bad, but I just feel that it's very interesting that studies have shown that maybe 40 to 50% of the people, it doesn't actually work for them in regards to again, anti-depression or anti-anxiety medications. Yeah, and that's not to say some of these anti-anxiety medications um, are necessarily bad because for a lot of people, Mm -hmm. it is very helpful for them um, and makes marked improvements on their lives. Uh, But you also have to understand and to all of the news and press coverage that psychedelics are getting inside of the media, psychedelics are not a panacea. They're not an end-all, be-all cure Mm -hmm. for everything. For people, some people, they just don't work. I mean, we're all individuals. We all have our different chemistries. We all have our uh, own different backgrounds. It's just that it is being shown empirically with evidence and result-driven therapy that these kind of things, these kind of substances in conjunction with therapy are, are super beneficial to a large swath of society. Absolutely. And here's another thing that I may, that may help my listeners and tune the population. Cause a lot of times, you know, we may not know what would actually happen if we want to do like a psychedelic assisted therapy. Uh, could you uh, inform us on like usually the process that would happen with the therapist and the client? Well, there are many programs out there right now. And since there is no standard uh, since they are still um, not FDA approved. Um, but there are states and countries that you can provide this kind of therapy uh, to individuals. However, um, with phase three trials currently underway for MDMA through MAPS and phase two trials currently underway through Compass Pathways, uh, we will see these substances uh, become Uh, decriminalized and rescheduled, and that will allow for a standard of practices throughout America. So, for instance, MAPS currently has an MDMA-assisted psychotherapy training program, which I'm a huge proponent of, uh, just because they're the standard bearer within the field. Um, But you're going to see a lot of others come down the way. Um, For instance, you know, psychedelics today they just rolled out, actually, I think this month, uh, their vital training program, um, which does similar things, uh, but with the end goal uh, to remain, make sure that everything stays safe and efficacious. Uh, so, you I mean, you can, you can look at a, a bunch of different training programs, um, but I, I personally would recommend sticking to the ones that are, that, uh, are more empirically verified that have uh, a whole following behind them. Um, Could you actually explain a little bit more to the listeners what MAPS actually is in general? MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, It was founded by Rick Doblin. um, And their whole goal, it was to make sure that they were providing 
uh, a service to the community uh, revolving around uh, the substance MDMA, which is their, their main component. Uh, they've been around for quite a number of years, I think over 30 years now. Uh, but Rick Doblin really saw a need to uh, treat veterans with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And he knew by doing that, uh, he would be able to garner, get, get support within, within the government. Um, so I know that they're operating here in the States. Uh, they also, I believe, consult in Canada. Um, if anybody, if I'm saying the wrong things, I'm sure all the, your listeners will correct me. And that's, that's totally fine because I like to, I like to learn. Um, but also in uh, Israel as well. Okay. So I want to ask your personal opinion on something. Let's say if a therapist wants to get into this, right? Uh, do you feel like they should try it, let's say, at least once in their life, um, like a psychedelic assisted therapy before they could do it to other clients? So. Uh, that's, uh, that's the golden question inside mm -hmm. of the community, Jake. Uh, um, I think it's really up to uh, the person that is going to commit themselves to psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, mm -hmm. as far as the counselor on the counseling side, whether they choose to take the substance or not. Um, I know through maps, you do have the opportunity to take MDMA, um, which I think is very important, but for a lot of other people that may not work uh, because with MDMA, along with a lot of these substances, uh, there are there are potential risks involved. Uh, so you kind of have to talk to your doctor about that. Uh, me personally, I, I would be I would be all for it. Uh, it is a powerful modality of healing uh, and understanding where your um, patient is going to be inside of the journey, I, I think is very important to the therapeutic process, the, that client counselor relationship. You know, and I, I do fully agree with that. And again, I'm not going to lie. I kind of, it wasn't really biased. It was more of a, my personal fear of not knowing what would happen. Let's say if I did take like a, me personally, if I did take MDMA, like how, what, would, what would the side effects be? And would there be any long-term side effects? Now that I know a little bit more, like I can make a better decision on that. But again, like, again, it's just naiveness. You know, I didn't know. So then it causes a little fear in me regarding that, you know, step. And, you know, and that's, that's unfortunately one of the other casualty on the war on drugs is we don't have that kind of information. We don't have that kind of uh, research. We don't have that kind of information available for people to, to make informed decisions for themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what do you think about the future of psychedelic, uh, therapy so after we get past phase three what would be the next final step or well phase... yeah yeah that so the way that i see it and i know that a lot of people within the community see this as well as it's, it's going to be a three-pronged approach so you're going to see the the medical model you're going to see the wellness model and you're going to see the spiritual model um so the medical model um if it's rescheduled uh, and then it's available for psychotherapists to use with inside of their practice. We'll see a paradigm shift. The way that I like to look at it is there is a gigantic tidal wave that is about ready to crash into our society mm -hmm. and into psychotherapy that I don't think that we've ever really seen before. It kind of happened in the 60s, um, but unfortunately, the way that it went about was not, not the best. So a lot of the medical model, the people that are interested in the medical model in the space are trying to keep it very close uh, and keep it restricted enough to make sure that there is no harm being caused to the general population. Because, you, I mean, you know the, what, the way the media is, mm -hmm. you know, you, you get one wrong story about this and then it's going to blow up and then the media is going to completely turn against the, the whole movement. I know that they're really trying hard uh, to stay away from that. So that's, that's really the medical model. As far as the wellness model goes, we're going to see a lot of retreat centers, uh, open up companies like field trip, mm. opening up these, these wellness centers where you can, you can go in and have a bunch of different modalities, whether it's yoga, meditation, nature therapy, massage, uh, the list goes on and on. 
um, but also with the the medicine. Uh, I know in Jamaica there is a psilocybin retreat center that you can go and essentially have that that sort of thing. Um, Canada's getting ready to. I think they're already moving on a lot of this stuff too. Uh, so that's that's really the wellness side of it. And then you have the spiritual side, which I'm probably most interested in, other than the fact that I'm going into psychedelic assisted psychotherapy myself. But that really comes with uh, um, utilizing some of the practices from the indigenous cultures. Now, places like the Native American church, you, you have to be a member of the Native American church to, to partake in their, their ceremonies. And then you get into the idea of sacred reciprocity within the space, as a lot of these are medicines that are being utilized by these indigenous people that probably we as white people with privilege should probably think about just letting them have their own thing and us looking towards other modalities for ourselves. Um, there's a big problem, for instance, the whole peyote, uh, since it's becoming more and more popular, there's not enough to go around. Mm -hmm. It only grows in a very tiny space. I say tiny, relatively tiny space in Texas and North Mexico. Um, and there's annual pil pilgrimage by these indigenous people that go and to collect these plants, these cacti, these sacred, sacred plants. Um, but what we see is a lot of white people go in and they harvest it. And then there's not enough for everybody else. Uh, not enough for these indigenous peoples to utilize it within their ceremonies. And it's, it's, it's a crying shame. And the same thing you could say about the Sonoran uh, desert toad. Uh, the Sonoran Desert Toad, is, they extract, um, I guess, the mucus uh, excretions from these toads and use it and uh, smoke DMT, 5-MeO-DMT five, five that comes from that. It's just the same kind of thing. There's just what we're doing to the world, what we're doing to our environment, what we're doing to these sacred plants and uh, medicines and animals. It's, we, we really need to get a hold on it. Absolutely, because again, we want to help out like all cultures in this, and we need to be aware of our actions and what we do, and how we can again have a negative effect on that. Absolutely, you know, I'm curious too. What would happen in the future when we get this solidified? Is how our insurance companies going to, I guess, handle this? That's I've always wondered about that. How we would get reimbursed for these type of therapies? That's also a huge question in the space. You do your homework, man. <laughs> She's a thought, you know. Uh, it's uh, from from the way that it's looking. Uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy, um, since MAPS works very closely with the federal government, whether it's the FDA and the DEA, um, and also insurance companies, I would wager that it will be reimbursed by insurance. Um, it's very expensive. Uh, I think the initial estimates for a full round of uh, MDMA treatment was looking at about $80,000. Oh, my God. Um, now, Rick Doblin did get the FDA to make concessions because originally you have a two-person team throughout the entire process. It has to, it, they had to be an uh, MD or PhD, and he got them to concede to, because he didn't think that made sense, to a... Uh, licensed psychotherapist and the, for the second person can be uh, entering. So that reduces the cost substantially uh, away from that. That's good. That's good. Well, you just provide a lot of great information for us, man. Again, I know my listeners and myself greatly appreciate it. I also want to get an understanding of um, your, again, page Again, you being the founder of Adlerian Psychedelic Society, would you like to talk to the listeners a little bit about that and then what you hope from the program and your page as a group? Well, I founded the Adlerian Psychedelic Society in the hopes that I can bring students within um, Adler Graduate School a place to kind of convene and talk about uh, what is going on within the space. Uh, it, originally, the idea was to make it not only just for people to advocate for the subject, 
but I was hoping to get people that were also critical on the subject because I thought there was going to be a lot more blowback and criticism mm -hmm. than I actually have received. Um, in fact, I've, I've got nothing but su support for, from everybody that I've talked to. I am heavily indebted to Adler for the chance to be able to talk about these subjects and not to be scorned or criticized. Um, I think really what it comes down to, and even if therapists are not going to use these kind of modalities in their treatment, I think it's also very important that there is a language and a vocabulary that they can use with, with their clients about it. The way I like to explain it is if you say, for instance, you had no idea what psychedelics were about, you did not, didn't necessarily agree that people should use them, but you have a client that comes to you and talks about that, that kind of mystical, deep experience that they've had. It's like, do you have the language and the vocabulary to talk about that? And I, I think that was also the branch of the Adlerian Psychedelic Society is I wanted to get people that may not ever have anything to do with it, just so a place where they can come and look, look at resources so they may be able to have that kind of conversation with their clients in the future. Because it's coming. A lot of these, these, uh, these experiences are going to be very prevalent in the next 10 or 20 years. I just want to make sure people have the right tools in the toolbox to use with those, those clients. I think it's very important. And from a coordination of care aspect, I think it's also important. Let's say there's a therapist or a probation officer or another healthcare worker that has a client that's interested in this. If that healthcare worker, let's say, does not really know about psychedelic assisted therapy, that they don't just jump to, oh, it's horrible, it's negative, and then form these stigmas so they cannot give adequate information to the clients to help them out. That's what I kind of and luck, worry about. Yeah, and luckily um, within the space, I don't have the book with me, but um, there actually was just, there just published a medical handbook for medical hallucinogens um, that was specifically geared towards um, uh, healthcare providers and clinicians to educate uh people on the effects, whether it's uh, physical or mental, psychological, you know, that whole holistic approach to the human being. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I just have to say, man, thank you for an amazing podcast. I certainly have learned so much. And another thing that I liked about your, um, your page is that I found this really cool book called The Wind is My Mother by Bearhart. I literally just got that book a few days ago and uh, it's an audio. I got an audio book form and I just, I love it. I absolutely love it. Bearheart was an, uh, an incredible man. Um, I mean, I could, I could speak a lot to that because right now I'm in multicultural uh, counseling. So oh, nice. I'm, I'm heavily in that space, that, that mindset of making sure that we appeal to the indigenous people um, or trying to help them where they're at, meeting them where they're at and, you know, Bearheart was, he kind of was in this limbo in between the, the traditions and his culture that his people carried for thousands of years, and then being right, coming up in a society that was, uh, was not, not that way. So he kind of straddled, uh, I guess, the, the traditional white ethnocentric model of, of culture, which is totally, total fallacy. Uh, but that's for a totally different uh, conversation, but in his traditional model. And what I really liked about it is he really walked through the, his experience being a shaman and how that impacts uh, the people around him and him advocating for that kind of thing. Um, and he actually discusses peyote use um, inside of the book, which is very interesting because a lot of those, a lot of those spiritual modalities are not necessarily talked about in, in the indigenous context because that's very personal to them. So for him to be able to share that with the reader that's not necessarily indigenous is really a gift. And I, I thank them. I, I, wherever you are out there, Bearheart, thank you very much. Amen. Me as well. Me as well. Well, before we go, Rick, uh, would you like to let the audience know if they want to find more information about this stuff? how they can get a hold of you through, I guess, phone, email, or whatever? 
Well, uh, probably the best way to, to reach me is either on the Adlerian Psychedelic Society via Facebook. Um, you can just search there, uh, ask to join, I'll prove it. Um, if you want to get a hold of me personally, you could always email me. It's Richard, R I C H A R D, dot D as in David, dot O'Bannon, O B A N N O N, at gmail.com. Um, that probably the easiest way to, to reach me. I'm, I'm always here. Anybody needs uh, just a, somebody to talk to. I mean, I guess that's the reason why I'm going to become a counselor in the first place. Um, future podcast. I'm, I'm always here to help or educate. Absolutely. And again, it was a great benefit for me and the listeners, man. It was uh, truly awesome having you on. Thanks, Jake. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you everyone. I also want to inform everyone that if the information that was said on this podcast was not meant to be taken as therapeutic advice, if you find yourself dealing with mental health issues, please seek the professional services of a medical doctor or a licensed professional counselor. All right, thank you, everyone. Bye.